Hi everybody, uh, my name is Fraser Kane and I am the publisher of Universe Today and this is your virtual star party for July 1st, 2012. Happy Canada Day to, uh, to everybody. And so uh, we have, let's see, we've got two, let's see, we've got three telescopes, three astronomers tonight. So we've got Gary Ganella who's down in uh, Los Angeles area and that's the, uh, this beautiful view of the, uh, the North American Nebula. We've got Howard McCalsey and is it the Cave Nebula? That's the Cave Nebula. Cave Nebula. Nebula. Yeah, and we've got uh, we've got Mark Barrett who's in Chicago, and that is of course the Moon. Yes, it is. And uh, we're going to do something a little different tonight, which is uh, Scott uh, Lewis is going to provide some context. So he's going to fire up the old Stellarium and give people an idea of where everything is in the in the night sky. So Scott, let's let's see how this works. All righty, pop her on over. And if, and if no one has, has, you know, if you don't have this, Stellarium is a fantastic piece of software. It's completely free for, it runs on Linux, it runs on Windows, it runs on Mac, and it gives you this beautiful view of all of the objects that are up in the night sky. It lets you zoom in, lets you see where all the constellations are, all of the deep sky objects, unless it's completely frozen. <laughs> are you not seeing me? No, well, it's, oh, there we go, there we go. There we go. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we see it. Maybe zoom out a bit and sort of show what the sort of where where the what constellations are up right now. What we're going to be looking at. Well, I can do the little fish eye too. Perfect. I don't know if people can see this. So there's the moon, right? Moon's right over here. And I know some of the things that um, Gary had planned is going to be over here in Cygnus. Mm -hmm. We have Vega over here as well. And that's where we'll see the Ring Nebula. Mm -hmm. And we can move her on around. Saturn's right over here. And we have Mars as well. And so tonight what I'll be doing is, as we're going through the different objects with the, our different astronomers, I'll try to be following along with giving you guys... Um, a view of the night sky and then also zooming in so we can see not just how beautiful the great detail is at these wonderful magnifications and resolution, but also get an idea of if you looked up right now where exactly we're looking. Now this is the view from San Bernardino, so this is what you would see right now on the west coast, um, but you can, you know, from what, uh, actually everyone's on the west coast right now. No, sh no, Mark's in Chicago, no. so, mm -hmm. so he's a couple of no, hours right. ahead of, of the west coast, right? So, right? so he's seeing things move forward, a, you know, a few time zones worth. And a great and thing I'm with And I'm showing from the Canaries, so I'm, say, seven hours ahead. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. And you can so, always change where you're at on, on the planet as well. So we might be having teal tonight. You can always change down to Australia. You can go wherever you need to. So if you want to look at something you, where you would not normally be, say, since I'm in the northern hemisphere, you can go down to the southern hemisphere and see a completely different sky. Uh, Luca wanted to know how you spell Stellarium. It's like D-S-T-E-L-L-A-R-I-U-M, Stellarium. Yeah. I'll it, post it's a, link a combination to it of the word stellar and planetarium, so they just got rid of the planet part and replaced it with the, yeah. the Latin root for stars. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. Um, okay, great. Well, let's go. Let's, I want to start with Mark because this view of the moon is just fantastic. And, and Mark, you made a massive discovery this week that I think we need to go into. Well, thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, basically, all I did was uh, email uh, the user group list for Backyard EOS and said, hey, you know, does anybody know a better way of using uh, a can you know, just a Canon digital SLR as a webcam? And uh, one of the guys on the list sent me uh, an, e an email and said, uh, check out this software called Extra Webcam. Basically, it lets you use any Canon camera and a whole lot of other stuff just as a, a webcam. So on Google+, Plus here it just shows up on my drop-down list of webcams that I have. Right, and so it's called Extra Webcam, and it turns your your Canon DSLR, you know, into a webcam. And so we we we've been finding that the best way to do this really easily is if you have a telescope, you get a T adapter, a T ring adapter, and you can put your DSLR into your telescope, and then this is the way that then gets that into the into the Hangout. It is awesome. Um, I don't know if there's a version for the Nikon's. Um, 
so, and I forgot to introduce, of course, Dr. Pamela Gay, who is my co-host on Astronomy Cast, and we've also brought along for color commentary Roy Salisbury, who is one of the uh, one of the astronomers, but he's away from his observatory right now, so he's going to provide us with some color commentary. Scott Lewis, who of course um, was the fantastic astronomer who was giving us live views of the transit of Venus and uh, the last uh, solar eclipse. And recently joined us just now is Teal Bristra, who is in Australia. So we're getting the other side of the Earth right now. Wow. That's beautiful. Can, I don't know if, you're, if your camera's working, if, you're, uh, if your mic's working, Teal. I know Teal was having some audio issues, so Teal, yeah. if you want to say anything, uh, just I am me. And I'll <laughs> he's going he's gonna to talk through Scott. That's right. Okay. So, um, that's yeah, cool. I think my mic's working. It's just no, my it sound reception's really bad. You're, you're fine. Okay. You sound oh. great. Ooh, you sound okay. Great. Yeah. Ooh. So this, this worked, so you, so we got, this is hilarious, so about 10 minutes ago, what, this is the reason why we started a little bit late, was we told Teal about using this software, and he was able to get it installed and get it running and get this view into the Hangout in 10 minutes. Yeah. Gorgeous. That's amazing. Can, now, can you try and zoom in on that yeah. um, top center? It looks like there's a dude who fell madman <laughs> style across the sun. So can you can you do that five times zoom, <laughs> Teal? Do you have you learned how to do that yet? Mark, he literally you, just uh, not yet, but I can you. actually do it straight through the camera. Too. No, but oh. but there's apparently there's a hockey. Mark, can you explain how to do that? Uh, yeah, on the uh, control panel, if you've got the uh, extra webcam software maximized to take up your full screen, you should see a whole bunch of exposure controls and stuff on the right hand side. You got it. Okay, there you go. Um, that wow, is wonderful! Look at that grouping. Wow. It's stunning. You can, see, you can see the umbra and the penumbra. Gesundheit. <laughs> it's the lighter, darker parts of, of the magnetic spots. What, what's crazy is that's the same words that are used during uh, lunar eclipses for when you have the, part, the, the lesser shadow um, on the moon and then the greater shadow on the moon. Um, so two totally different physics concepts, and the same words are applied. That always messes me up. That's but beautiful. I still see Madman Dude falling across the sun. I love Paradelia. That is gorgeous, though. Man, I wish we had this for our, uh, for our Venus transit. Well, we have it for the next Mercury transit, so that will be fine. And we have it for the next Venus transit in 105 years. We'll that joke dead. just never gets old. <laughs> All right, Gary, and what have you got here? Okay, uh, this is part of the North American Nebula. This is the Gulf of Mexico area. Right here is Mexico. It's flipped from what you'd look at uh, a map. Florida being over here. And this whole nebula extends probably four times the width of what you're seeing down to uh, the right. And Pamela could tell us some neat stuff about it. It's basically just a fairly nearby giant cloud of mostly hydrogen gas with pockets of star formation in it. And when you see where you see brighter areas, those are areas that have uh, more light passing through them, more star formation, where you see the darker bands that look like termites have been eating on the cloud. Those are places where the molecular dust is much, much darker and is blocking the light from behind. And were you to see this in, in color, it's, it's fabulously red. And that red comes from uh, the hydrogen atoms when they're going through all their different um, ionization states and energy states. The most powerful one that we see in the optical is the 3 to 2 transition of that one lone hydrogen electron. So as it's coming back down to its ground state, it goes from the third energy level to the second energy level and gives off a brilliant red light. It's identical to the red you see in a neon open sign. Is this a picture that you took? If you can see this, no. This is from the Sky program. Hmm. And it shows you the field of view of my camera. Oh, wow. So we're huh. looking pretty much at this area, and you can see how much it extends. And there's the Pelican Nebula up here, which I'll move to in a moment. And I think, Scott, have you, are you actually sort of homing in on it, where it is? I can't hear you, Scott. Might help if I unmute myself. So we have Cygnus here. And yes, this is actually where the North American Nebula is. Right here in the north. Yeah, side. So and, and we have so east. 
So it's going to be in the northeast sky from right. and, San Bernardino. And if you go out in the, in the summertime right now, the main grouping of stars that you're going to see, or the really familiar, is the summer triangle. It's these three stars. You can see Vega, which is almost the brightest star in the sky right now. You can see Altair, and you can see Cygnus. And those three stars form the summer triangle. And they start to show up in June, and then they're really high in the sky across July and, and August. So, and so where we're looking is really close to Cygnus, which is sort of the, the most southern of those three stars in the, in the summer triangle. And, and when you look at Cygnus, you can clearly make out the triangle within the greater summer triangle, which makes it easy to figure out which of the corners you're at. That's fantastic. It's beautiful. I just saw a plane fly through the moon. Did you? Awesome. Yes. Hopefully it flew are in you, front are of you the moon and not through the moon. <laughs> Um, no, I'm not recording by. video. <laughs> You're not recording. Okay. Um, so we got a question about the about the sunspot. Uh, Alan Davidson wants to know why are the sunspots darker than the rest of the sun? Uh, they're just cooler. It's it's a place where there's a magnetic field line that has emerged through the surface of the moon of the sun of the sun, and is going in in a different spot. So these always appear in pairs. And when you look at them with with a detector that allows you to make out the magnetic field lines, you can see that one is the north pole of the magnetic field line, and the other is the south pole of the magnetic field line. And there's plasma that would form an arc if we could look at this on the edge of the sun. And then where that plasma arc attaches to the sun, you have these two dark spots. This is so awesome that we're seeing the moon and the sun, the full moon and the full sun at the same time in a hangout. Planetary rotation is an awesome thing. And the internet. <laughs> Thank you, Google+. Plus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were you going to switch to something else, Gary? Yeah, I'm moving over to the, uh, the pelican which is right off the edge here. So let me, uh, let me get it framed um, up. So Nick Nolte wants to know, I have a 12-inch LX200, and I just got T-rings to attach my DSLR, which is great. Nick, you're ready. Join us in the Hangout yeah. as soon as you can. Uh, what are some easy-ish objects for a beginner to image in a light-polluted area? Saturn, Jupiter. The moon. The moon. Yeah. 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 Globular clusters are yeah, kind of an like awesome starting point. Well, Mark, you're in a really light-polluted area. What's what's your experience? Yeah, uh, Saturn, the Moon, Jupiter. The very first thing I saw through my telescope when I got it, and you know, as you saw from the plane going through the Moon, I'm you know about a 10-minute drive uh, from O'Hare Airport, and uh, you know I was able to see Saturn, you know, and pick out the rings, and you know, it blew my socks off, you know, the first time I saw it. Uh, then I'm, I'm able to pick out moons of Jupiter. Uh, the, and some of the uh, the cloud patterns on it, uh, and obviously the moon when it's not cloudy. Yeah, uh, to, and some of the brighter objects, some of the more uh, tight objects, like like can you see the Ring Nebula? Okay, from your location. Um, I haven't. I, I've been able to pick out the Orion Nebula from my location, uh, and Pleiades. You know, I can see seven of of the the stars in Pleiades uh, when it's not behind my house. But uh, I haven't had too much luck with Nebula without having to uh, drive out to a, a fairly darker site. Nebula are hopeless. Yeah. And what about star clusters? Star clusters actually work really well. I, I know this. I used to use a LX200 16-inch, admittedly, um, and in downtown Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is right across the river from Boston. And we were able to get open clusters, globular clusters, no big deal. Those work beautifully. I'll have to try some of those. Uh, Registeel 2000 asks, if light takes 183,000 miles per second, doesn't that mean we see everything in the past? Yes. Yes. And one quick thing. Um, I see that Torstein Appelhagen is having issues. <coughs> Sorry, I apparently can't say his name without choking. Um, uh, in Germany, unfortunately, YouTube Live is blocked because Google hasn't paid for a television broadcasting license and Germany con considers YouTube Live to be a form of television broadcasting. We're sorry, and Germany. We'll never, we'll never be able to see this. Live. You can Live. see it later. You can see right. it later. So later on, when you watch the, uh, the recorded video, you will understand <laughs> what happened. <laughs> um, can you go back to the whole sun, Teal, if you're listening? And the zoom back out again. Although I love, it's just a rock solid 
uh, yeah. lock on the sun. That's just amazing. Yeah, no problem. So and Roger Brandon is asking, when is the best time to look at the moon with a telescope? Um, time meaning time of day and time of month. So, so time of day, um, if it's in the sky, you're pretty much good. Um, time of month, what you want is to look for the moon to probably be half to less than half full if you want to look at craters. If you want to look at the differences between the bright places, there went another plane. Um, and the dark places, then you want to look at it when it's close to full. So it depends on what you're interested in looking at. Craters show up best in quarter phase. Color features show up in full phase. Yeah, right now the, the moon is almost a full moon. And so we really see most of the moon is just washed out because we're seeing the light hitting the moon face on and we're not seeing any of the real shadows. But you can see down near the edge of the moon where, the, where part of the sunlight still is kind of hitting it at the side, you can see um, you can see the shadows of the craters, and so and now Mark is actually zooming in to show that you can see how those craters. And so, what you want the best time is when the moon is half full and and less, because then you're going to get as much of the moon with these nice long shadows on the craters, and then you see all of these features, all this beautiful relief. So it's just a tough time right now. It's it's not a great time to see the moon, but it's there. So let's look at it. Mm. So this is how you know this is live. That's beautiful, Gary. Thank you. I'm doing a two-minute right now. That's a one-minute. I'm at 87 seconds into a two-minute. We'll get more definition. Uh, what, what is it? Is it? Well, it looks like an eagle. That's it does. The, that's the Pelican Nebula, and this is the area yeah. between the North American Nebula. We were down just below the bottom of the picture when we were looking at the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the area between the two, and it should be 107. And this is what's called the Pelican Nebula. Now, Scott, where, where is it located in the sky? It's actually right here, just uh, below Deneb. If you can see right here is Deneb. It's part of Cygnus as well. So, Yeah, so Deneb again, the three stars of the Summer Triangle there, Deneb, Vega, and Altair, and mm -hmm. it's right beside Deneb. Right. But, but this is one of these, I mean, this is a pretty tricky object to actually see for most people, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's the fact that he has an H-alpha filter that makes it pop out the way it does. The, the specific filter that Gary has on his telescope is one that only lets through the color of light that um, is coming from a black body, which is something that gives out light at, at all colors of the rainbow. So it's coming from a star or a galaxy, something like that, that gives off all colors of light only at the shade of red that is the same as the 3 to 2 transition in hydrogen. And of course, it picks up all of these beautiful emission nebula. Now, what's glorious about this for where Gary lives is he's in the light polluted LA basin. So all the sodium lights that are out there, all of the white LED street lights that they're starting to use, all of that light is in specific colors that aren't the H alpha shade of red. So he's able to erase all of that light pollution from the sky just by using an H-alpha filter. And, and what I love about this particular image is as an astronomer, I'm used to everything being rotated with north up in a very specific way. And this is actually rotated slightly and flipped from what I'm used to in astronomy. And I think it's actually a much more beautiful way to show it. So just if people are wondering, we're, um, you can post comments on Google Plus in the, uh, where the, the actual Hangout is happening. You can also post comments if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you're watching this embedded on CosmoQuest or some other place, you can always uh, make a post to us with, on Twitter with the hashtag Space Hangout. And that'll come through as, as well. So we can kind of, I'm watching all the comments, and that's how I'm able to answer to everyone that's, uh, that we're seeing this. Um, just a bunch of questions. Uh, Lee White wants to know how close the two nebulae are to each other. Scott, can you answer that? How close are, are the two nebulae together? Well, I can actually give a brief um, visual example there. I'm not exactly sure as far as distances go. Will it actually show it in Stellarium? Yeah, it, it yeah. allows you to measure angular. If you zoom right in, you might be able to even yeah. see the two. It's not going to show it labeled, but I can pull up some extra details here. So this entire gaseous complex, for lack of a better way to describe it, is about... Keep zooming in, Scott. I think it tries to show it to you. No, never mind. No, I don't think it's going to show it to me, okay. sir, just because of the limitations of the software. They're really close. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's um here. This is um from my astronomy, the sky X. And you can see the purple rectangle is my field of view oriented just about right, but it's flipped. So this is where I was down here below. Wait a minute, on the wrong picture. Here we go. <laughs> I was down here below on um the Gulf of Mexico we were looking at, and then I moved up and this is the area between the Pelican and North America. So you can see it uh what yeah. it looks like right there. That's beautiful. All right. Something else. More, more, more. Okay. Uh, Howard, we haven't we haven't sort of talked to you for a second. What have you got? That's, uh, that's NGC 1000. That's, um, it's a galaxy, and it's in the constellation of the Andromeda. Wow. I don't see... Oh, I, it's pretty faint. How long is your exposure right now? This is... Um, I don't control the exposures on this, but I, I suspect it's... There's, they do about three luminance shots and about three in LGB, you know, red... red green and blue, so I don't know where we are now. 9.34, so it's only four minutes in, so you'll get color in a few minutes. Um, so, Mark, I, I mean, the view of the moon is absolutely gorgeous, but I want to see if there's anything else we can find. So can you get a view of Saturn or Mars from your position? Um, it might be a little bit too late for that. It might be behind my house, uh, and my software just crashed. So I'm going to go mess with it and see what I can see. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, that'd be great. Now, where is he located? He's in Chicago. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, we'll go back to Teal's view. Unfortunately, I can't ask Teal to go to anything else because uh, yeah. it's, it's daytime for him. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, look at the other lack side. of being a binary. Yeah. There we go. Um, so, to, for everyone who's watching who is like didn't know that it was happening, um, we'll there post the best star I could find. <laughs> <laughs> we'll post an, an event notification that this is happening, so uh, you'll be able to. We did this a couple of days ago, and so you can put it in your calendar. Um, you can also follow us on, you know, if you follow Universe Today on Twitter, if you follow CosmoQuest on Twitter, CosmoQuest X. We'll, we announce it. We try to announce it in the virtual star party feed, on my feed. We're trying to get the notifications to happen as, as best we can, but I know that it's, it's kind of rough. So the, the um, event one worked real fine this time. Did it? Did I, that work I, for people? Yeah. yeah. It worked. yeah. I, I get notifications, and I, I can say, well, tell me again in five minutes or ten minutes, and yeah. it kept coming back and blinking me. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what's this, Gary? That is a crescent nebula. That is a 60-second exposure. Let me get a little more contrast here. And I'm right now doing a two-minute exposure. There we go. Oh, Alan Huff is asking on Howard's image why there's the plus sign on the bright star. He, he identified it as a galaxy. It's actually a bright star. Um, that's actually, it's called diffraction spikes. And what's happening is the telescope has the big mirror at the base and then there's a hole in the center and it's a complex optical system where the light comes down hits the big mirror hits a smaller mir mirror in the center of the front of the telescope and then goes back out the back of the telescope well it needs four arms to hold that little tiny mirror at the front of the telescope and those front four arms cause the star to have these diffraction spikes when your exposure is significantly longer um, so that's that's actually what you're seeing. The galaxy is still hiding from view. This is a really, it really, is. really, really faint one. But it's a beautiful star. It is pretty. And you can actually start to make out star colors in this image where you see the bright one is blue, there's several red stars, and it's neat to get to see the reality of stellar colors in an image. And I think, Scott, have you got where the, the Crescent Nebula is located in Cygnus? Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, so I see you're you're being really conservative with your movement, Gary. We're still in Cygnus, aren't we? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stuff in that area. That's true. Yeah. So we've only moved. So before we were near Deneb, now we're kind of a little further down the the constellation. Yeah. And so what what is it, uh, Pamela? What is this thing? I the don't Nebula. know what uh, the. 
I th- it's think uh, an it emission. It looks like a supernova remnant, is it? No. Yeah, that this is. I I don't know every object in the sky, so I'm looking quickly. <laughs> Sorry. Well, wait. Um, I did actually take a look at it earlier. It's about five thousand light years away, and I think it's called the Wolf Rayet stars are actually just blowing <laughs> solar winds out there, um, which is just being caused because so much thermal kinetic energy is is going over the gravity of the actual stars, which is blasting all this matter out. So, so wolf ray stars are very, very young stars that are actually um, pushing, they have so much radiation pressure that they're using the radiation pressure to push material out that's trying to fall onto the forming star. The star will eventually go supernovae, but in the process it's blasting material out of the region around it to form this nebula. So we had a couple of questions on what people recommended was a good sort of starter uh, telescope. And Roy, what's your what's your suggestion on a good starting telescope for people? Uh, depending on what objects you want to look at, um, I would say a good starting telescope would be a good refractor. Just as so you don't have to worry about, like on the, the Smith Cassegrains like Gary has, you don't have to worry about collimating your optics and all that kind of stuff, but a good refractor, a good maybe three or four hundred millimeter refractor, probably about three hundred bucks. It gives you good views of the moon. You can see some some large nebula like the uh, North American Nebula. Um, that was actually one of my first scopes was just now, a good refractor. Now, you, now refractor, that's lenses, not mirrors. Right, right. So it's we'll just like it's just like the Galileo scopes. Yeah, yeah. So it's like a you know it's like an old timey you know <laughs> pirate telescope that uh, that you look through lenses and and the light is bent as it goes through those lenses as, as opposed to a reflector where the light is uh, focused using mirrors. Right. And uh, so so why do you like the refractor over the reflector? Um, it's just I just don't like the fact that you've got. With the refractor, you don't have, I mean, you've got one thing moving. You've got your focuser moving, and that's it. With the reflectors, you have to collimate optics. You have, depending on the type of instrument you have, it could be open. You get dust in it. You get, it's just it's a one-piece thing that's not really going to break. And so you should look, be looking to spend a couple of hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sorry, Howard, there's a lot of background sound there. I'm just going to mute you. Um, and this is the uh, two-minute on the Crescent, Fraser. So now where do people recommend that you get those telescopes? Um, you can get them from Orion. Orion's got some good scopes. Um, Astronomics has some really good uh, telescopes. Um, if you're just looking for the, the low-end, entry-level type of stuff, yeah, I just go to Orion. Um, telescope.com, telescopes.net. Orion's got about the best values for... Yeah, I think so. Celestron has a few, but they really... You're going to go to them for, like, the uh, the Schmidt casting rings and stuff, not really the refractors. Yeah. If, um, if you're on the East Coast, you can go to some place like Adorama in New York to yeah. test things out. If you're on the West Coast, there's Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Middle of the country, you're kind of abandoned. Um, but this is what star parties are for in real life. So find your local astronomy club, go to one of their star parties, wander around, and I'm sure all of the people want to show off what their gear is capable of doing. Um, so, so Mark, have you have you given up on the moon? Um, I haven't. Unfortunately, there with the amount of cloud cover that I'm having, and the brightness of the moon, and the amount of trees I have surrounding my backyard, my field of view is pretty limited to where the moon's at, and the moon's washing out just about everything except for itself. So, so I no way to get Saturn to me. Uh, yeah, Saturn's uh, behind a, a tree and behind my house, so unfortunately I can't get Saturn tonight. If we started a couple hours earlier, I could probably ca- catch it a, as it was setting, but... Yeah. Well, we a, a bunch of people told me they were rained out tonight, so so as always, if you're an astronomer and you would would like to help us out, uh, we're always looking for more people to help us out. You know, if you've got a telescope and you've got some way to get a view from your telescope into your computer, we can help you do the rest. You're 99% of the way there. The rest of this stuff is easy. So, um, so we'd be glad to help you out. And so we're always looking for more astronomers to pitch in. So all you have to do is just reach out to me or Scott Lewis is in the in the Hangout as well. Talk to him, 
and um, and either of us can help you get set up and sort of work through all the technical challenges. So that would be great. Um, TM NAF recommends that you get Terence Dickinson's Night Watch for a good guide on how to choose a telescope. I agree. We all are big fans of Night Watch around here. Yeah. Just as a book. I mean, it's just about the best astronomy book that you can get your hands on. So we were all, you know, it's great to teach you your constellations. Great to teach you how to get a telescope. Great. Uh, Marion Murdoch recommends that Mark moves to the armpit of the desert. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Well, you, that's your challenge. Move up to the desert. Um, you know, if I could find a job that would support my telescope habits uh, <laughs> out in the desert. Done. Hey, trust me, in the desert, it's not as much fun as you think it is. <laughs> um, but it's a dry heat. Yeah, so it doesn't Mike, matter. It's only yeah. 100 degrees out there right now. So. so Mike Madden wants to know what telescopes we've all got. Gary, okay. what have you got? I've got a Celestron 14-inch. I'll uh, give you a quick shot here. I love this. Where'd it go? Wait a minute. I, I'm clickingly challenged right now. There's, uh, there's my scope live right now. I moved it over to point at uh, M16, which is the next one I'm coming up with. I'll move the camera a little bit. So there it is in the live view. So it's a 14-inch Schmidt Cassegrain, and I'm using it at prime focus where the camera is up here at the front of the camera. This is a dew shield, uh, more actually a clutch shield, so that I don't bump into the camera and destroy my telescope. Um, and then, Howard, you're using remotely a, a telescope. <coughs> he was we muted. Need you, you need to unmute. Yeah. I think he's got the 20-inch uh, twenty-inch plane wave. I'm not sure. It's one of the telescopes through SLU. Uh, Mark, what have you got? Uh, I've got a little Mead ETX 90, so 90 millimeters, uh, very small, very portable scope, uh, not a lot of uh, parts to it. Yeah, so I think if people are really enjoying Mark's view of the moon, that's a fairly inexpensive telescope. Like, what does one of those run? A few hundred dollars? Uh, no, it, it has a go-to computer mm. uh, on it, too, so it's a little bit more expensive. Uh, I believe it is, I'm just Googling it real quick here. Because uh, I don't remember what I paid for. Because because what I paid for it and what I tell tell my wife I paid for it are two different stories. Yeah, and there's no way she's going to be watching this uh, yeah. hangout at some point. Exactly. It's not like this is being recorded or broadcast yeah. on the air. It's about four hundred dollars. Right. And Teal, what have you got? Uh, yeah, I'm running a Celestron. It's a CPC 800, which is an eight-inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain on a fork mount. And the camera I've got on the back of it is just a Canon DSLR, so it's a T3i. Yeah. So, and this is the thing, right? If you've already got some kind of, you know, a lot of people are now getting into photography. They've got DSLRs. If you've got a DSLR, like a Canon DSLR, you're already, you know, you've already got a $1,000 camera that you can now connect up to a $300 telescope and be and be taking beautiful astrophotos. And so this is, you know, this whole uh, hobby is just changing you know, night and day now. Pardon the pun. Another great way to start too is a nice pair of these. Uh, yeah. These are some Celestron 15 by 70. I got them, I believe, for 60 US. They were on sale. Phenomenal for getting started and just getting to know the night sky. I have some uh, solar filters as well, so you can actually look at the sun without uh, being yelled at by anybody or burning your eyeballs out. But it, it's a great way to inexpensively get started in astronomy. So you know that it's not just a fleeting you know, love affair. It's something that you actually become passionate about. And it's great to hold on later on in your astronomy, too, because you're always spotting and taking a look at new things. Yeah. And, and honestly, the one scope that hasn't gotten spoken of yet is, is I'd, I'd agree with everything Scott just said. Start with binoculars. But, but the thing I've always gone to next is a Dobsonian telescope. You can actually get um, setting circles for this that will say slew left, slew to to indicate uh, how to get to the object you want to get to. And um, Dobsonians, they're easy, they, they work, they teach you the sky. Um, oh, so Gary, what's, uh, so what's this? This is M16? What is M16? Uh, yeah, this is M16, the Eagle Nebula. Oh, I'm getting a bit of an echo from you, Mark. Um, the Eagle Nebula. 
Yeah, I'm getting some uh, offset lighting at the moment. That's a 60-second shot. I'll move in a little bit, and we can see more of it. Where's the pillar? Where are the pillars? Um, is anybody else hearing a beeping, or is it me? Just you. Okay, my headphones might be running out of batteries. <laughs> um, yeah, let me try to get a better shot. It might be a little bit behind a tree. Almost looks like I got some of the neighborhood light in here. Uh, yeah, because usually with that view, you're able to start to see the pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula, right? So mm -hmm. what is the Eagle Nebula, Pamela? I, it's just a large uh, cloud of gas that is in the process of getting eaten away through star formation. So it was nothing more than a molecular cloud until something caused it to collapse such that stars started forming. And the stars are eating away at things like the pillars of creation. And as these young stars continue to burn in about 50 million years after their formation to 100 years after their formation, they're going to start going off as supernovae. And it's believed, it's believed that because of the distance to this object and the age of this object, that were we able to see it in the moment as it appears if you were in it, that it would actually be completely destroyed by supernovae right now. But because it takes light so long to get here, we're able to see the way it looked beautiful in the past. Can you zoom in some more, Scott? Keep going. Yep. All the and way. As far Alan as I'll let you go. Is, Alan Huff is asking, what are the pillars of creation? They're, they're actually fingers of molecular gas that have um, stars forming inside of them. And, and it's because they look like pillars, because they have stars being created inside of them, they were cleverly named the Pillars of Creation. Right. And so this is the, this is the live view. Um, there was a question that someone asked uh, a little while back, wanting to know if there's any way that we can see um, nebula and stuff in a live view. And so I think it's important to sort of under, for people to understand the distinction of what's going on here. So, so we either do a live view of the sky or we do a, you know, a, an exposure view. And everything we're doing is live in that the telescope is right now currently pointed at its object. We're not showing pictures of, that have been taken days or weeks or months ago. It's all live. But you know, what view you're going to get all depends on the length of time that you do your exposure. So in Mark's case, for example, the moon is so bright that you're just going to get, you know, you just run video and you're just going to get this beautiful live view of, of the moon. And that's why you can see these clouds moving past and you can see these, um, I'm still getting this echo from you, Mark. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute you. I hate to do this. Um, so you can see the, the clouds moving past and you can see when Mark, when Mark zooms in five times um, to some spot, perhaps the Terminator, uh, you can see the, the ripples of the, of the atmospheric distortion. And this sort of shows you that it's alive. And the problem is that if we went and like actually uh, did a much longer uh, view, it would just blow out. It would just be a white blasted uh, ball in front of us and we wouldn't be able to see any detail. And so that's why you want to turn down the exposure and, and, and increase up the, the frame rate. But, and the same thing goes for teal. So this is a live view of the sun. And so again, you can see how the, the atmospheric distortions of the atmosphere in front of the sun are causing the, this sunspot to kind of jump around in the scene. But with, but with what Gary's doing, because these objects are so faint, he has to gather light for a certain period of time. So he'll do a 10 second exposure or he'll do a one minute exposure or a two minute exposure. But when they're actually doing uh, like really sort of deep astrophotography, they might do five minute exposures or, you know, even longer to get all the light that they can. Now, now one of the neat systems that's out there is, is a system that will allow you to see in real time the image building up. So initially all you see is the stars in the image. But every half second to second, it gets a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, and you can see it constantly reading out and adding the images together, allowing you to sort of, kind of, maybe be able to see a live video of the nebula. But what you're really seeing is all of the photons adding up on the detector over time.
Now, one of the things that, that astrophotographers can do after the fact is they can take video. So, for example, I don't know whether Mark is doing this tonight, but he could be taking video of the moon. And then when he's done, he can stack the video frames together where the computer tries to align them together and try to pull out any extra details, but without overexposing it. And so what it, you'll get is the most crisp view possible of the moon. You know, it's like if you take the best of the entire video footage and turn that into one frame, then that's what you get. And so if you see a lot of the pictures that we post of the, of the star parties, they are um, they're these stacked images. And so that's why these views of Saturn and Mars and stuff are so crisp and beautiful as they've been stacked. And so you get this really high-end view. And, and J, um, Jace Pearson asks the perfect follow-up question. Since he's taking longer exposures to see these objects, would we see the same thing if we look through the eyepiece? And the thing is, our, our eyes, they do actually integrate light somewhat, but not enough for something like this. So if I were to look through Gary's specific telescope at these objects, all I'd see was the brighter stars. Now, what you can do is just get a really, really big telescope, and the bigger the telescope, the more it funnels all of that light into your eyeball. But uh, it's sometimes easier to use a smaller telescope with a camera. Uh, and Gary has moved. Yes, uh, I was shooting through the top of a tree. Oh. Um, this time of year, I've got some trees off to the uh, southeast of me, and uh, the eagle happened to be behind the top of one of the trees is why it was looking so bad as shooting through leaves. This is the uh, veil, which yeah. is a, uh, a huge area. Um, in fact, I'll show you um, what the whole thing looks like. Yeah, this is a supernova remnant that, that is giant. Again, this is the, the purple square is my field of view, and all of these pieces are all part of it. Yeah, it's it's it, this is a star that went boom, and um, it it's only about fourteen hundred light years away, and so it's it, it manages to take up a huge amount of our sky because it's relatively close in the grand scheme of things, and it's been expanding for a good long time. Yeah, that's beautiful. So this is clearly not being blocked by those trees. No, no, it's higher up. I moved back closer to the Cygnus area, uh, right um, down the... Mm -hmm. Wendy Cahoon asks, uh, if a spot on the sun set out a flare right now, would we see it on Teal's view? It happened not eight and a half minutes ago? Well, no, but he's got yeah. a hydrogen, but he doesn't have any hydrogen alpha filters, so no, right? right? No, I, I don't think... Yeah, I don't think so. I think you really do have to be looking in H-alpha to see that. And the, for the non-technical people, um, there's, a, there's a specific kind of filter that, that we use when we're looking at different kinds of objects, and the, it's called an H-alpha filter, and that views hydrogen at this very specific wavelength. And that also happens to be the, the wavelength that shows you features in the atmosphere of the sun. And so uh, if you've got a special filter, then you would see all those flares and those cool, uh, you know, prominences and stuff, features on the surface of the sun. But this doesn't look like, like Teal's got an H-alpha filter. He's just heavily blocking the, the aperture of his telescope, but he's not actually using this very specific wavelength. But when we did the Venus transit, if you want to go back and look at the Venus transit, you can see the view that Scott had was with this very special telescope called the Coronado, which is a hydrogen alpha, alpha filter telescope, and so we were seeing these, these features in the sun's atmosphere at the same time that we were watching Venus pass in front of the sun. Um, Andrew wants to know, uh, how do we know what kind of filter to use to capture the real color of the nebula? That, that's a tricky one, because nebulae generally give off most of their light in single specific colors that are created by the elements getting excited. So when you see green in a planetary nebula, that's from oxygen. When you see the red, that's from hydrogen. So each of these different colors is specific to a different gas. Since that's where the bulk of the light is, what a lot of astrophotographers will do is take light with a sulfur filter, with a calcium filter, with a uh, just working their way through and then very carefully add it until they get it 
get something that's artistically pleasing. Another strategy is to use a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter and figure out using standard colored stars that you know when you look at it exactly how um, what color it should turn out and so you can balance your three filters using the standard color stars just like you might use a, a card when you're doing actual photography to set your um, red, green, blue, white, black, gray values. Um, you can do the same thing using known stars in the sky and those three filters. Um, trying to get things to look true color to the eye is very difficult because, well, we don't always know how things would look for the eye and that was another plane going in front of the moon. This is clearly a common event. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. I think that might have been a bug, actually. Okay. Bird. Yeah, it moved in a weird way. Um, Fast moving bug. Uh, yeah, Jace, just, uh, your internet crashes. We did answer the question, so if you watch the, uh, the archive version, um, you'll get, get it. It's a big, long answer, so. <laughs> um, Teal, can you actually show us a view of the limb of the sun so we can sort of see just to show that we're not, we're not actually seeing the atmosphere. Like, right now you've got it zoomed in on this, this sunspot cluster, and it's gorgeous, but I'd love to see sort of just the limb of the sun. Yeah, yeah sure. And Howard, is that an open cluster that you have? Cool. Oops. Am I, unmuted? Am I unmuted now? Yeah. yeah. M34. M34. Right, and it's in, your last, it's in the last two minutes, so you should see some color. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so this is an open cluster open of stars. Place. So this is a system that started forming stars about 200 to 250 million years ago. Um, and over time, because this cluster of stars is located in the disk of our galaxy, as it orbits, the stars closer to the center of the galaxy are going to move ahead. Those that are further out are going to lag behind. And the system will get stretched out. In, in the fall, you can actually go outside and see an example of this effect because if you look at the Orion uh, Nebula, the Sword Nebula, that's a, a star forming region in the process of actively forming stars. If you then look over to the Pleiades, that's a system that's significantly older, has pretty much finished using up its gas and dust, but it's still tightly packed. You then look over at the Hyades Cluster, which is around the eye of, of Taurus, um, then you can see this amazingly stretched out system that's actually hard to piece together as a cluster. Um, so here's the, here's the view against the, of the limb. And so I guess what I wanted to say, oh, this is great, Teal. Thanks. You got a sunspot and the limb of the sun. That was, uh, now you're just showing off. You can actually <laughs> see limb darkening in this image. I know, I know. But what you can't see is these prominences. And so yeah. when we had this view with Scott using the Coronado, you actually could see these these bursts coming up off the off the surface against the limb of the sun. It was really beautiful, quite amazing. Now, now someone asked, uh, you know, can you just buy these filters? You absolutely can. Mm -hmm. The problem with an H alpha filter is they are super expensive. All narrowband filters are super expensive. They're just very hard to make. It, it's what's called an interference filter, which means that the light goes through one side of the filter and most of the light that isn't the right color gets reflected off, but different intervals of it will make it through, hits the other layer, and then you use different internal reflection and interference and a variety of things that just are too complicated to explore without a whiteboard um, take place before finally letting that single color out through the interference filter. And it's just expensive to manufacture the glasses precisely. And you need to have the filter over the business end of the telescope, right? So it's a pretty big filter um, for, for, for a solar the, filter. For the solar <coughs> filter. If you're yeah. using H-alpha the way Gary is, you get all the light coming into the telescope and then you filter it before the camera because you're not worried about shredding your optics by having too much solar light. Right. You know, one thing that, that nobody's mentioned is that it's not only hydrogen alpha filters or oxygen or whatever else, you can get just light pollution filters. Yes. So if you're in a light polluted area where you want to do this, you can get just a light pollution filter, which is not as expensive, which will cut down a lot of the glare, and you can start getting in a lot better pictures. 
Yeah, that's on my uh, wish list. I found a, a, a filter that actually clips into my camera yeah. uh, right in front of the mirror, and there's just enough room for the mirror to still actuate and everything to still actually awesome. function. And I think it's about $150. Yeah, so that's you can see it in your live view of your camera or your photos of your camera or you know, wherever you need. That's a very nice filter. Uh, one, one of the interesting points made in in the um, thread, and I'm trying to figure it out though. So Jonathan Jonathan Langdahl um, said, so it, don't they know the actual colors of the specific gases? So why why is artistic license? I'm I'm paraphrasing what he wrote. Um, so when I let light through a hydrogen alpha filter, I know exactly what color it is. When I let light through an oxygen filter, I know exactly what color it is. The problem is, I don't always know how much light got through the filter. And the red filter may let more red light through than the green oxygen filter does. So in trying to figure out how to balance those two colors, that's where the artistic license comes in. Um, Mirrors reflect different with different colors. Glass transmits differently with different colors. So every reflecting surface and every transmission surface in a telescope is going to change how much of each color gets through the entire optical system. Um, so that creates all sorts of biases in your final image that you have to figure out how to balance out. The, the telescopes that I've personally used are stupidly overly sensitive to red and you feel like you have to expose forever to get blue light through them. And that just happened to be the system I was using. What have you got, Gary? Uh, this is the center section of the veil. I'm doing a two minute on it right now. Uh, just to give you a reference point, uh, see if that's framed right. Um, Right down here is what we were looking at before, and now we're looking at this area at this diffuse piece of it, and then there's another piece up here I'll move to. You can really see this is a star that just went, right? Yeah. Well, and it did it nearby a long yeah. time ago. This yeah. Is, this is about 50 light years across. And so you're just seeing this shredded material expanding in this circle, and it's big because it's close and kind of old but not super old. Well, it needed time for things to move 50 mm. light years. Yeah. It's pretty profound. Right. But, but what's, what's amazing about this is the material is so diffuse that you can only see the edges of the bubble. There, there's actually gas all connecting in front of this and behind, but when you're looking through it, there's just not enough to be able to see it. You can only see it along the edges where um, more of it is bump, bunched up. Yeah. Okay, and here's a two minute, so we're getting better definition in the dust lanes, and in this area you can see the lanes and the, what am I trying to say, the tendrils? Why do we get these tendrils in the, in the, in the nebula? It's just interactions with the material that's, that, that permeates all of space. It's, it's a place where the blast wave of, of the supernova and the remnant of the supernova hit the surrounding gas. One of the things we don't always think about is, is space is filled with a very diffuse level of stuff. This became extremely um, apparent when the st star V838 Mon underwent a flash, and that flash going through space illuminated all the surrounding interstellar materials that up until then had been completely dark. With supernovae, the reason we get all of this is you have a compression of the surrounding material, and it's getting heated up in the process of the comp compression. Yeah. Well, this is good. Well, I think we're just nearing the end, so I just want to uh, get a couple of last views and start to just give the thank yous and say the goodbyes. But um, just to let people know, so uh, as always, we, we're going to be doing this every Sunday night, uh, and we see what we can see, and we get what we get with the people who have uh, a nice view of the night sky. So uh, tonight we were lucky that we got uh, both the sun and the moon at the same time, which I think is a first. Yeah. Great. Um, and I think this is the second time Teal's joined us. I know there was one other time before, but it, I'm really glad you were able to make it this time. Aren't you usually working, Teal, in Australia on, on a Monday? Yes, yeah, this is the It's Canada Day. It's Canada Day, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, I'm usually at work at this time, so I'm lucky because my boss decided to change days with me this week. Oh, Excellent. perfect. 
That's great. No, I'm really glad. And so we need to do the Down Under edition where we'll give your view of the night sky. How are you in fairly light polluted area? How, where are you? Where are you located? I don't know if you got that. All right. Uh, <laughs> great. All right. Well, I think I will, I will start to wrap things up. So, so, Gary, thank you once again for providing your view from, uh, from Los Angeles. It's been beautiful. It's been very diffuse nebula night. You're clearly in a mood tonight. Yeah, I guess I am. Uh, I got another 15 seconds, and I'll do a uh, 60 seconds on the upper part of this. That yep. way you'll have seen all the major pieces. Wow. Ten seconds. We're coming up. We'll get the image. All right, we'll wait. We'll take Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know Frazier's usually not one to wait for anything. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. So I'll answer one more question while oh, we... Oh, that's well. beautiful. Look at that. That is pretty. And in this one, you can kind of see the lighting in this area. As yeah. Pamela said, there's gas through the whole thing. And yeah. You can see it's coming up, and then you get the nice little other end of the... But that is the... Um, just to give you... Where it go? Come on. not following my mouse. To give you a perspective, that is now I've moved up to this part right here. Excellent. Right. Fantastic. That just plays back on the, the, the reason, that, like Pamela was saying, with the... the the different lenses and or the different filters and why not use the right colors and everything else is because if you was to actually do this in red, green, and blue, you're not going to see as much as if you do it in narrow band because of all the contrast. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. All right, and thank you, Howard. I'm not sure if you're still muted. And the, yes. this cluster. No, I'm is, not. Oh, there you go. And the cluster is a. Uh, this is a double open cluster of oh, uh, NGC six eight sixty nine and eight eighty four. That's yeah. nice. Lovely. Yeah, that's wonderful. And Mark, your your view of the moon was rock steady, and this has been a phenomenal new technological breakthrough, and we all appreciate it. Yeah. Although I realize it's not really going to solve our problems for some of the the longer exposure stuff. So it's going to be great for the planetary stuff, but I don't think it's going to help with the uh, with trying to do some of the nebulae and clusters and stuff. But yeah, we'll have to play around with it, see what yeah. what else we can do with it. Uh, yeah, I wonder, I mean, it, you know, maybe if you can talk to the actual creators and see if we can get them to give us some exposure control to give a little more control over the camera, that would be great. I ha it gives some basic exposure control. Uh, the thing it doesn't do that something like Backyard EOS does is, uh, you know, there's no capture plan. I can't record video straight to my computer like mm -hmm. I can with Backyard EOS and some of the other, uh, you know, nice features that that, uh, yeah. that program has. Yeah. Oh, well. And thank you, Pamela, for, for bringing the science, and we really appreciate it. And, uh, and so if you have never heard, Pamela and I do a podcast every week called Astronomy Cast, and we're up to uh, episode 280-something, 60-something, 70-something. Anyway, a lot of that. We've probably got about 300 episodes in the feed, and we cover different, uh, you know, different episodes every week. We cover a, a different topic in space and astronomy, and in theory, we're going to record tomorrow. I think yes. is the plan. Yeah. That that's the plan at uh, 2 p.m. Central, which is noon Eastern, three. Uh, sorry, noon Pacific, three Eastern. Yeah, and uh, and thanks, Roy Salisbury, uh, who normally has a uh, beautiful observatory out in the uh, in the desert of uh, of uh, Arizona, but is uh, has to work tomorrow, so he can't stay out there tonight. And Scott Lewis, thank you very much, Scott, for bringing the, the Stellarium to the show. And Scott is kind of the main guy who's actually been helping people technically to, to get prepped and ready for coming into doing these hangouts with us. So if you have any interest at all in participating, we'll take any telescope, you know, small, not very powerful telescopes, very powerful telescopes. We really want people to see the difference of the kinds of technologies that we're all using to be able to, to do astronomy. And so if, if you've got a great telescope, we'd love to have you. If you've got not a great telescope, we'd still love to have you. And as you can see, I mean, I think Mark has got something that's more on the, the consumer level, the kind of thing that most people would be able to buy. Uh, 
Did that sound nice enough? <laughs> cheap, you, you, can, you can say I have a cheap small telescope. Cheap, That's okay. Mark I'm has not a cheap small telescope. Has a has a reasonably priced moderate power telescope that was delivering a phenomenal view of the moon. So so that's what you can get, and I think it's great that we can showcase all of the ranges of the objects. Um, and thanks to thanks to Teal, who's in Australia, and it's great to have him have him have him join us again. So so thanks to everybody that, that, that joined us. Thanks, Thank Howard. You. All right, we sign out. One apology, I got a request for M81 and M82. Uh, I didn't get to it. I'll put it on the list for next week. Sure. All right. Okay. Good night, all. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all next week. We'll see you all next week. See you Friday night, Gary. Oh, yeah. Uh, No, not this one. It's the one after. (laughs) Okay.